Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, begin turning to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're getting more into, last week we did an introduction to the book of Colossians, who they were, who was writing to them, the significance of the book, and then now we're getting into this idea of hope. So we're going to look at hope all throughout the book of Colossians. We're going to see, today we're going to be defining just what hope is and what's the foundation of our hope. We're also going to be looking in the weeks to come, the hope that we have in redemption, the hope we have in the gospel, the hope that we have in sound doctrine, the hope that we have in new life and all those different things. But today I, uh, I wore a shirt, Sin Relief. It's uh, North American Mission Board. Um, it just says, Meeting Needs, Changing Lives. The reason I wore this shirt today and wanted to be a reminder for us is to pray for those who have lost hope in North Carolina and parts of Tennessee. As you all know, the Hurricane Helene went through and there was a lot of devastation. There's a lot of towns that were there one day. The next day, that town no longer exists on the map. Literal whole towns like Estill and Huntland and things like that, that site, just all their, all their buildings are gone. And there's no, there's no evidence there was a town there. Uh, neighborhoods that are no longer there. There was a neighborhood there, and now there's no longer a neighborhood there. There was a road there, now there's no longer a road there. Most of the major bridges going from Tennessee over into North Carolina are gone. Um, I-40, they're thinking at least a minimum of two years before that can get opened up again between Tennessee and North Carolina. And we know how you know, construction and government projects work. That too might be 15. But there's a lot of devastation that's happened and there's a lot of people who've lost hope. And they've lost hope because a lot of their hope was put in the things of this world. They had hope in their, in their maybe their businesses or their homes or their, their families or their communities. And they had their hope in those things. And those things have been washed away. Literally removed and washed away from them. As believers, we understand we have a hope that is firm. We have a hope that cannot be washed away, cannot be impacted by any storm or any act of man. And so what I want us to do, though, in, before we talk about hope today in Colossians, I want us to take a moment and just pray. Not only for those families that have been impacted, they still have many people missing throughout parts of North, western North Carolina. We're going to pray for them. We're also going to pray for the people that are going in. Um, disaster relief. The, the, through the North American Mission Board, we have a disaster relief. And Tennessee disaster relief teams uh, are some of the, the best disaster relief teams in the nation that go out and do these things. And so we have people going and serving. So in the midst of this devastation, we have people coming in, providing aid, but most importantly, providing the gospel and providing hope to people who have lost all hope. And so we're going to pray for those families that have been devastated. We're also going to pray for those who are coming in to be light and salt, who are coming in to provide physical needs and spiritual needs as well. So if you join me in praying. Father, we want to come to you this morning because you are glorious, you are amazing, and you are all-powerful. You see and know all things. And so we come to you with heavy hearts, thinking about the families and the lives that have been impacted by the hurricanes that have come through. Such devastation, such a reminder that the things of this world are fleeting and passing and temporary. Father, we pray that for those families who have lost loved ones, who have lost friends and neighbors, that you would comfort them. That you would bring people into their lives that will love on them, that will encourage them, that will build them up and help provide for their needs. And most importantly, Father, we pray that you send out laborers into the field who will be light and salt, who will take the gospel of hope taking a hope that cannot be impacted by the circumstances and the brokenness of life. 
but a hope that is sure and that is everlasting. Father, today we ask that you help us to be a people that is faithful to not only give, but to go. Go to places to love people well, as you've called us to do. To make disciples, to be light, to be salt, and to care for the needs of others. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we do have to be your hands and feet, to be a part of your mission, to be a part of your work. So Father, we ask that you help us to be faithful to that call. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reason hope is so important is because hope is a massive motivator. Now, when we're going to be talking about hope in Colossians, we're going to be looking at this idea of hope being an expectation of good or like a joyful and confident expectation that we have of eternal salvation. We have, um, throughout church history, we see how this hope of the gospel and the hope of Christ has impacted people. Um, For one, Polycarp, he was a martyr around 166 AD. He was around 95 years old. He was brought out. He was going to be taken. He was going to be killed for his faith. He was asked to denounce his faith, to, to turn his back on Christ. And they tied him to a stake to burn him. They called on him to repent and swear allegiance to the emperor. And he said, I am a Christian and cannot do it. He said, we Christians are not accustomed to change for better or for worse, but from bad to better. And they said, but you will be burned alive. He said, your fire will be spent in an hour. But that which is reserved for sinners is eternal. Even in the midst of possibility of being burned alive, he shared the gospel and he was trying to implore them to believe. Ignatius, around 116 AD, was also, as he was about to be martyred, he was about to be given over to wild beasts. And he said, now I began to be a disciple, nor shall anything move me, whether visible or invisible, that may attain to Christ Jesus. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of members, let the shattering in pieces of the whole body and all the wicked torments of the devil come upon me. Only let me enjoy Jesus Christ. All the ends of the world and the kingdoms of it will profit me nothing I would rather die for Jesus Christ than rule to the utmost ends of the earth. Him I seek who died for us. Him I desire who rose from the dead. Two pastors in England in the 1500s, Latimer and Ridley, they were going to be executed, running each other. Ridley said, Be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flames or else give us strength to endure it. Latimer replied, We shall this day, brother, light such a candle in England as by God's grace shall never be put out. There is a hope in the gospel that moves us to action. And that's what we're going to look at today. So Colossians chapter 1, you've turned there, verses 3 through 8 is what we're going to be looking at today. So 1 Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope In the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, it is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this from Epaphras, 
our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he has told us about your love in the Spirit. As Paul's writing to the church of Colossae, we see here this word hope that pops up kind of the very beginning here. And ultimately, he's talking about how this hope has impacted their faith, it has impacted their love, and it has impacted their leadership. And what is this hope founded upon? It is founded upon the word of truth, the gospel. Our hope is rooted in the word of God. And that's important because everything else will pass away, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. So when it comes to your hope as a believer, it's not like as a believer we have this that hope is some wispy feeling floating in the air that you hope to grasp a hold of. But our hope is sure because it's rooted in the word of God and the word of God is sure. There's a lot of things in this life that will come and go. There's a lot of things that will pass. But there's one thing that will endure forever, and that is the Word of God. From generation to generation. If you think back to the time that the church was started, roughly 2,000 years ago, you can read about that in the book of Acts, and we see, and I read some of the uh, statements that were made from different believers and martyrs throughout history. A lot has changed from the days of Jesus to, the, to today. Massive differences in the culture, in technology, in the times, how we relate to one another, how we can travel. So much has changed, but there's one thing that has endured the test of time that has never changed. And that is God and His Word. See, for a long time, people put their hope in a king. The king would lead them. For a lot of life, people put their hope in money. And businesses. And those things have come and they have gone. See, we have a hope as believers that is a certainty. God is going to be glorified. God is going to redeem his people. God is going to live with his people. God is going to wipe every tear from every eye. These are not maybes. These are certain guarantees that are going to come to pass. So we don't hope like the world hopes. Our hope, we can step out with confidence and act upon. So we've got to stop, as believers, we've got to stop viewing hope like the world views hope. See, the world views hope as in a, I, maybe this will or will not happen. And when I think about that, I think about, so in my house we have, we have chairs. We have a lot of chairs in our living area. Um, we just do. Apparently, we just collect a lot of chairs and furniture and things like that. Every space has got to have somewhere to sit. But anyway, so but in our house, there's this stool, which I keep meaning to take out and throw away because you look at it, and you're like, if I go to sit in it, there can be a hope. Like, I hope I don't hit the ground at some point. But see, that's how the world views hope. It's like, I, I, I hope something. I don't know if it's, it, this may be bad. This may, I don't know, but I just, I, I'm hoping it might be good. It's an uncertain type of hope. Now, there's other chairs in my house. I go and sit in. I don't even think twice about it. I just go and sit down because I know that it's going to hold me. Those are two different types of hope. I have a certain type of hope in one chair and a different type of hope in another. One chair, I think every time, oh man, I hope this doesn't fall. Another chair that never comes to mind. As believers, we can have a hope in Christ that's so certain, we don't even have to question, we don't even have to think about, we can step out and act because the hope that we have in Christ is certain. We don't have to worry. God will save his people, he will redeem his people, God will be glorified, we don't have to worry about that. As hurricanes come along, as political unrest, as we see rockets being fired across the world and possibilities of wars and all those things, we don't have to worry because we know. We know that the gospel is true and it is a certain reality that God will save his people and he will see us through. 
Think about David for a moment as he wrote Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Now what's really cool is this is a, there, this, he's kind of putting out different types of hope there in that passage. That valley of the shadow of death was a very specific thing, a very specific place. See, in that day and time, everybody worshipped, there was a lot of bell worship. Bell was this God who came along and he walked through this valley and he was conquered and he was eaten by this, by this demon and his sister had to come save him. And the people were afraid of this valley of death. Even Bell, even this God that people worshipped was afraid to walk through that valley because it meant death for them. And David said, no, no, no. I, even if I was to walk through the valley of shadow of death, I would not fear. See, a lot of the world has this idea of hope, of like, I don't know what's going to happen. I hope it's good. Whereas believers, the hope that we have in Christ is, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it will be for the glory of God, and it will be good. No matter what it may be. So when we talk about hope, we're talking about a certainty of expectation. Not a I don't know expectation, but a certainty. So what I just want to look at with this hope and this idea, if we have this hope that's a certain expectation, that means we can act upon it. We should be acting upon it. Just like if I believe and, I, and this chair is going to hold me, I'm going to act upon it and sit on it. Hope is a call to action. And here we're going to look at three things specifically. Our faith in Christ, our love for one another, and faithful ministers. Again, in Colossians 1, when he says, We always thank God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. See, hope in, in the gospel and hope in Christ is, is connected. So when we have this hope in the gospel... Faith becomes possible. Because without that hope of redemption, how does our faith grow? How do we even have faith? If what Christ has done in the gospel is not true, where would our hope be? And then where would our faith be? In Romans 10, 17, it says, So faith comes by what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. See, our faith is directly tied to the gospel, the hope that we have, the word of God. It's connected. So because we have hope, we can now have faith. And that faith is not some passive faith. It's a faith that changes everything. And if the hope of the gospel gives us faith that God will see us through, that he will take care of us for all eternity then surely also that faith and that hope is good enough for our day-to-day -day life. And I think that sometimes we're, as believers, we may miss the connection there. We have a hope of the gospel, and we say, I know because of Christ, I'm eternally secure. He came, he died on the cross for our sins, he was buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And we have this eternal idea, like, I'm going to trust Christ for my eternity and my salvation. And if we can trust him for our eternity and for our salvation, shouldn't we then also be able to trust him with our day-to-day -day life as well? Shouldn't we be walking by faith daily as well? See, the hope of the gospel is not also just something that is far off and like one day my faith will be sight, one day I will be with the Lord, but it's also today I can walk with the Lord. Today I can walk in the Spirit. Today I can enjoy you. Today I can enjoy the glory of the Lord and, and see Him work and move in my life. The hope of the gospel impacts our day-to-day -day faith. Where we walk by faith and not by sight. 
And again, going back to that connection of the word, the hope that we have is connected to the word of God in Psalm 119, when it talks about your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Meaning daily, I'm going to walk and I'm going to trust the Lord. So if you have hope in the gospel, you have hope in Christ, that's going to be manifested and, and worked out in your day-to-day life and how you're walking with the Lord by faith. And here, Paul recognizes that and he's, he's encouraged by that. Look, I have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ. And later in verse 5, where he says, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. Because of hope, your day-to-day life and your faith has changed. You walk by faith. You're living by faith each and every day. So we see here that the hope that we have in Christ, that hope is going to spill over into our daily life. We also see that hope will also spill over into our love one for another. In verse 4 when he said, We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. See, that hope of the gospel directly impacts our capacity to love. Because when we understand how much God loved us in the gospel, how could we not then in turn share that love with, one, with other people or with one another? Especially those of the household of faith. If God loves me that much, he also loves that person how much? How can I hate or despise someone that God loves? I should in naturally in return love them. Jesus even said this was going to be a marker for them in John 13. It says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. Our love for one another kind of proves that we have this hope in Christ. And so that hope of the gospel should compel us to love one another well. Now it says, I am encouraged by your love for all the saints. Now we can't over, I can't, we can't gloss over that word all, meaning we don't get to pick and choose. Well, I'm going to love Jake today, but Aaron, I, I don't feel like it today. We don't get to pick and choose who or when we love or how we love. God is very clear what love is. And you can go to 1 Corinthians 13. You can begin looking at that. Love is an action verb. It's not something that's passive. Love is being kind. Love is being patient. Love is being these things. You've got to actively go out. So this love they had for one another, because of the hope of the gospel, they couldn't help themselves. They had to actively go out and look for opportunities and ways to love one another well. So the hope of the gospel compels us to go out and look. How can I love this person? How can I love this person? How can I love this person? So everything we do because of the hope of the gospel gospel should be seasoned with love. Love for God and love for one another. That should be one of the markers Because if Jesus loves us as sinners enough to die for us, a holy, righteous God willing to love the worst of sinners, how can we not love one another? How can we not encourage or lift each other up? How could we ever talk ill of one another? How could we ever ever demean one another? How could we ever do that because of the hope of the gospel? Our only response should be to love, to build up, to encourage, to to bring people alongside and, and live life with them for their betterment and for their good. See, because of the hope of the gospel... We can step out and we can love. Not only can we step out in faith, but we can step out in love. And it's something that we do. And it's something that we should do. We should be compelled. Again, because we have a hope that is a certainty. And when you have a hope that is a certain a certainty, you will act upon it. So if you truly believe the gospel, you truly believe God is who he says he is, you will not be able to help yourself. You will like, I will step out and I will walk by faith. 
And you will not have to worry if the moment ever comes, like with Polycarp, and he's tied up there, and they set this thing, and we're going to light you on fire, and he's going to be like, no, I cannot deny my Christ. Now, I encourage you, you can look up that story. They tried to light him, and he wouldn't stay lit. So they stabbed him to death. All the while, him sharing the gospel. You see, that was Stephen in the book of Acts. Being stoned to death, what's he doing? He's asking the Lord to forgive them. How could he, as he's being stoned, as people are being burned, as people are being headed over to wild animals to be torn to shreds, how could they be praying for people? How could they be sharing the gospel with those same people? Because their hope is certain. And it's so certain that it causes them to walk by faith and not by sight. It causes them to love others well. Their hope is certain. We also see here, because of the hope of the gospel, we can have faithful leaders and faithful ministers. He goes on here, we'll we'll pick up in verse 5. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in the the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you is bearing fruit and is growing all over the world just as among you since the day you heard it and it came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Now, as we mentioned before last week, Paul didn't, Colossae went in a city that Paul specifically went to It was kind of an outlying city, but there was people who heard the gospel. They were discipled, and they went and they started churches. And one of the places they started church was Ephesus, I mean, was Colossae. They went out and they started this church with a faithful leader who was faithful. The reason that he could go out, the reason they could go out and they could plant churches with confidence is because of the hope in the gospel. Because the gospel is so good and it's so great and it's so guaranteed and there's going to be people who believe it, then we're going to be able to establish churches. And so with confidence, they went out to start churches and to lead people and to make disciples. And so they went out and they did those things. But the hope of the gospel impacts the leadership within the church. Because when I get up here and I, and I read God's word... I can read it with confidence. Knowing that it's God's word that's sharper than any two-edged sword that will pierce the heart. Knowing that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Knowing that God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. I can read God's word with confidence because of the hope of the gospel, the guarantee of God's faithfulness, that his word will endure forever. In Titus 1.9, Talking about pastors and elders and leaders, it says, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict. Because of the hope of the gospel, we can have sound teaching and we can be encouraged by sound teaching. So that sound teaching, that, that sound doctrine allows us to know God more deeply, more intimately, which increases our faith, increases our our love for one another, our hope, and all those things. So we should be a church that longs for sound doctrine, good teachings, God's Word, because it encourages and it protects the church. And we can rely upon this sound doctrine. We can rely upon the word of God because of the hope of the gospel. The hope that we have in Christ. Everything that Jesus has said and has done has has come to pass and will come to pass. See, when we start looking at this idea of hope and it being rooted in the word of God, the gospel... It's a hope that changes everything. It changes how we live our daily life. It changes how we treat one another. It changes why we gather as a body of Christ. Hope changes everything for the good. 
the hope of the gospel. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we may become the righteousness of God. The cross is not just some happy little story. The cross changes everything, impacts everything. You had Saul who was going along and he was killing Christians, imprisoning them, doing everything he could to stop the church. And what he did, he met Jesus. Changed everything. You have the disciples going along. They're just fishing. Jesus comes along and they meet Jesus and it changes everything. And we have story after story after story all throughout church history. Of people living their life one way and then they meet Jesus and it ch he changes everything. The hope of the gospel changes everything for us. It's a hope that is a certain guaranteed. That's why it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not maybe, not hope so, will be saved. In Christ, that hope of the gospel literally changes everything. And so you need to ask yourself, has my life been changed? Am I different? Is the gospel changing how I see people, how I view people, how I walk, how I do everything? Is the gospel changing everything? So for us as believers, we've got to ask ourselves, okay, is, is, is the gospel, is that hope impacting everything about my life, or am I grieving the Spirit and living the way I want to live? Because as believers, Scripture's pretty clear, guys. We can't say, hey, I'm a follower of Christ, and then live for the world. Hey, I'm a follower of Christ, and then be a gossip, to be a slander, or to be an abuser. You can't say, hey, I have this hope in Christ, and at the same time, not love other people well. You can't say, hey, I'm a, I have this hope in Christ, but hey, when I pick a church, I pick a church based on how it makes me feel, not whether it's sound doctrine or not. The hope of the gospel changes everything. You should be different today than you were yesterday or five years ago. The gospel changes everything because it is a certainty. So in this world of uncertainty... When there's chaos everywhere, there's brokenness, there's, un, there's this unbelievable just what's going to happen over the next few months. we got this election, I don't know. What, what's going to happen there? What's happening with Iran and Israel? Is there going to be a, a Middle Eastern war that breaks out, that spreads across the world? What's happening to Russia and Ukraine? What's happening with our food prices? And why is milk cost $90,000 now? I don't know. And, and gas is going up. And I don't, there's so much uncertainty and there's so much brokenness. But in the midst of all of that, there is a light. There is a hope that we can cling to, that we can hold on to, that will never change, that will never be altered, that can never be impacted. Which is why Paul could say with such confidence, I am convinced there is nothing in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, principalities, war, whatever you can name, there is nothing that can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. You may be walking through that valley of the shadow of death. But in Christ, you don't have to fear. He'll see you through. We have believers who are in North Carolina who have lost everything. Their homes are gone. They've lost family members. But you know what? The hope of the gospel will see them through. We cannot avoid brokenness. We cannot avoid the hardships of this world. We cannot avoid those at all. And again, this is a letter to people and believers in Colossae who were facing persecution. Their city was slowly dying economically. There was hardship everywhere. And they get a message of hope. Because the hope of the gospel cannot be impacted, cannot be changed 
based on whatever circumstance you find yourself in today. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The word of God will never pass away. A lot of things are going to come and go, but you know what will not come and go? It will be God's word. It will be here forever and ever and ever. Because he is faithful. There is a hope of certainty that we have in the gospel that cannot be found or replicated anywhere else in the world. And so I encourage you today. Look to Christ for your hope. Not to yourself, not to your abilities, not to a political party, not to an economic system. Look to Christ. Because the hope of the gospel is the only foundation that will be left standing. Christ is the rock that we build our life upon. He is the foundation. He is the firm foundation. We have no other hope outside of Christ. So don't put your hope in people or institutions. Put your hope in Christ. And if you're here today and you have never put your hope in Christ, you have never become a follower of Christ. God made the gospel simple. That Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not live as fully God and fully man, and he went to the cross on our behalf. And there he took on the wrath of God. He died on the cross for our sins, he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. So we may have life. So we may have a hope. Jesus is now our living hope who stands at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession on our behalf. So that one day when we stand before God, the Father won't look at us and see us. He'll look at us and see Christ. But it comes with, if you confess through the mouth, Jesus is Lord. Lord means master, owner, ruler. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross, and come follow me. Whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. You want hope, you want life, surrender yours to Jesus as Lord. And believers, the gospel is not just a one-time thing in our life that we move past it's something we live by and remind ourselves of daily. We die to self and we follow after Christ. He is our living hope. So let us walk by faith. Let us love one another well. And let us be faithful to his word. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you that the gospel is a guarantee. Not a maybe, not a hope so, but a certain reality. And there are so many people that are walking around, all around us, friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, strangers that we pass at the store, that are living without hope. You have called us to be light and salt. Father, help us to be a people that take the hope of the gospel to all people in all places. That the hope that we have in you would compel us to walk by faith, to love one another well, and to cling to the truth of your word. Father, if there's anyone here today who has never given their life to you, they've never experienced the hope of the gospel, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Spirit, we ask that you bring conviction and that you draw them. That you do the work that only you can do. And that today they will cry out, Jesus is 
Lord, and they will believe in their hearts that, God, you raised him from the dead. Lord, help us to be a people that just don't give you lip service, but act upon everything you tell us to do. Not just to be hearers of your word, but doers. Father, help us to live out our hope. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to stand and sing together. Has the hope of the gospel changed everything? Don't leave today until you've committed to that.